This is Bloomberg Law with June Grosso from Bloomberg Radio. The man accused of being the mastermind of the September 11th attacks is getting a plea deal that will allow him to avoid the death penalty, a dramatic and to many unwelcome development in the prosecution of the deadliest terrorist attack on U.S. soil that's dragged on for decades. The Pentagon announced that Khalid Sheikh Mohammed and two of his accomplices will plead guilty to the murder of 2,976 people in exchange for a life sentence. Terry Strana, the head of the 9-11 Families United Group, told DW News that the vast majority of the families are angry and feel that justice was denied. He will not stand trial and he will not face a punishment by death, which is what was on the table. So this is something that KSM and the others wanted. So it's a victory for them. And I don't feel like we should ever give them a victory. This is a sign of a very weak leadership in our country to strike such a deal that, uh, like I just said, a vast majority of family members do not support, do not want, and we do not want him to have this victory. This plea deal only affects three of the five alleged 9-11 conspirators being held at Guantanamo Bay. Joining me is Matthew Waxman, a professor at Columbia Law School. Why have the trials of these 9-11 defendants been delayed for decades? So right from the start, I think the military commissions that were set up to prosecute detainees at Guantanamo for war crimes have been a failed policy. They were supposed to be set up in order to provide swift justice, but they've delivered anything but that. And I think there have been a number of problems that have slowed down the prosecutions, and especially these that are subject to this plea deal. When detainees were captured, whether on the battlefield or elsewhere, those agencies that picked them up were not preparing a case for trial. They weren't collecting evidence as you would in order to prosecute a criminal trial. There have been issues of evidence or confessions that have been obtained allegedly by torture. There are legal challenges that have been made, some of which have gone all the way up to the Supreme Court that have slowed down the process. And whenever you set up an entirely new court system, you have to basically develop all kinds of rules and processes from scratch. Tell us about the alleged mastermind, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed. So KSM, and he's usually known by those initials, is accused of plotting the attacks of September 11, 2001. Um, He's one of 30 detainees who are still held at Guantanamo. And he was a U.S.-trained engineer who becomes a key leader of al-Qaeda. And he and two of his accomplices have agreed to this plea deal They've been charged, among other things, with murdering 3,000 people in the September 11th attacks. And the basic terms of the plea deal are that they will plead guilty to murder and other charges in return for a life sentence rather than the possibility of a death penalty. I can see what the defendants are getting out of this deal, but what is the government getting out of this deal? I think it's a good deal for the government, and here's why. I'll be glad to see this case put to rest. I doubt this case would ever have been concluded if it proceeded, and actually carrying out a death sentence would have been a disaster, however much they may deserve it. So let me just say I'm conflicted on the death penalty because these are some of the worst people on earth who've committed unspeakable horrors. But I think actually carrying out a death sentence in this case would have been a disaster. I do feel for families of the September 11th victims who have had to endure the pain, especially of watching this unfold. And I know that they want finality and many of them are very supportive of the death penalty. 
But even if it were carried out, and I'm, I'm very skeptical that the government would actually have been able to impose the death penalty, I think in this case it would make a martyr of these detainees. I think the story would understandably be that the United States has put to death somebody who's been subjected to torture. That would only add to the terrible stain of Guantanamo and the CIA enhanced interrogation policy. You mentioned the families. Terry Strada, the head of one group of families, said, for me personally, I wanted to see a trial and they took away the justice I was expecting, a trial and the punishment. And Brett Eagleson, president of 9-11 Justice, said, we're deeply troubled by these plea deals. Should the government go ahead with a plea deal that so many of the family members disagree with? Well, this is a terrible dilemma for the government. And as I've said, I, I very much feel for the families who have had to endure not just the unspeakable pain of the deaths of their loved ones, but now 20 years of this process dragging on. I do hope that they feel some sense of justice, but there are other very powerful concerns and interests at stake here. And the U.S. government has to do what's right, taking into account all of these various factors. As I said, I don't think the death penalty ever would have been carried out in this case. And I think carrying out would have carried immense damage to United States interests, especially abroad. Last September, ABC News reported that President Biden rejected a set of demands that would form the basis for plea negotiations offered by the five defendants, and that included avoiding solitary confinement. Why is the government not releasing the details of this? Might it be because some of the details might be objectionable? I suspect some of the details are still being uh, worked out. I think some of them will need to be approved by the military commissions and through some other processes. But this is also one of the challenges of moving a case like this through a military justice process that hasn't really been tested. A lot of what's going on in military commissions is new. And so we don't know for sure how some of these processes are going to play out. That's been one of the problems plaguing military commissions from the beginning, is that this is an untested process. And two other 9-11 defendants are not participating in these agreements? That's right. For several years now, it's been reported that a deal like this uh, has been in the works, some sort of a plea deal for a life sentence in return for pleading guilty rather than the possibility of the death penalty. Originally, it was talked about as uh, possibly involving five of the direct perpetrators or leaders of the 9-11 attack plot. I don't know uh, why we're now talking about a deal involving only three, but you know, over the course of the last few years, we've heard that this deal is sort of on again, off again. And so there are any number of possible reasons why. Looking at the big picture here, the government is disappointing most of the family members with this deal. It's only for three out of the five conspirators. They're getting a life sentence for the murder of 3,000 people. After 20 years, doesn't this seem like a complete failure on the part of the government? So right now, there are 30 detainees out of a total of roughly 800 who were brought to Guantanamo since it opened in 2002. Most of them have been transferred or released, some of them to their home countries, some of them to third countries, with varying restrictions. Some of them were, were transferred for continued detention, for example, in their home countries. Of those who remain at Guantanamo, about half have also been approved for some sort of transfer, but we don't know whether that will happen anytime soon. A few, though, will never be charged. They're going to be held indefinitely without any sort of prosecution. I think Guantanamo has been a failed policy. It was originally opened to be a place that would hold only the very worst of the worst. 
And it turned out that many detainees who were brought there should never have been. Either they were cases like mistaken identity or they were low-level al-Qaeda or Taliban figures. It was also supposed to be an interrogation and intelligence center where the government would be able to uh, obtain a vast amount of information about future al-Qaeda plots and networks. And, And I think it failed in both its detention mission and its intelligence mission. That doesn't mean that it was not valuable in some important way. It kept many very, very, very dangerous people off the battlefield and prevented them from conducting further attacks. It also did provide some important uh, intelligence information, never as much as I think was expected, but it did provide some very, very important information. But from the beginning, there was never really a good plan for what was going to happen to the detainees long term. There were insufficient processes put in place for figuring out which detainees should be detained there and which ones shouldn't. It is indelibly associated with this idea of a legal black hole and with torture. And I think uh, many of those costs continue to accrue over time. The plea deals are expected to take place as soon as next week, so perhaps we'll learn more then. Thanks so much for being on the show. That's Professor Matthew Waxman of Columbia Law School. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, the rogue Fifth Circuit is at it again, finding an $8 billion a year FCC program to boost phone and broadband services for poor and rural communities unconstitutional. I'm June Grosso, and you're listening to Bloomberg. The ultra-conservative rogue Fifth Circuit has done it again, plotting a novel legal path in another attempt to limit federal agency power, this time by limiting Congress's ability to delegate decision-making to regulators. In a 9-7 on bank decision, the appellate court ruled against an $8 billion a year FCC program intended to boost phone and broadband service for poor and rural communities, finding that it's an unconstitutional delegation of Congress's taxing authority. The decision is contrary to decisions by three other circuits, making the Fifth Circuit once again an outlier. Joining me is John Bergmeier, legal director at Public Knowledge. So at the center of this case is the FCC's Universal Service Fund. Tell us about that. Sure. About the Universal Service Program, which has been in place really for decades now, which traditionally was you know, seen primarily as a telephone program for ensuring that everyone has access to telephone service, but increasingly is seen as a program to ensure universal access to broadband. And what it means is that telecommunications companies, like telephone companies traditionally, are assessed a charge that they have to pay. They do tend to sort of put it on consumers' bills and kind of make people think it's like a tax on consumers directly, but it's not. It is a charge that is on the telecommunications companies themselves, and then the money that they pay goes into a fund. And then the fund is used to subsidize broadband and telephone service to areas where it might not be economical. So rural areas where it's hard to make a business case to invest might help out there. It also helps low-income people. So there's something called the the Lifeline and Link-Up programs that make communication services more affordable. And it's also used to help uh, provide broadband to anchor institutions like uh, schools and libraries. So it's really part of making sure that the country as a whole and everyone in it, kind of regardless of where you live, has access to telecommunications because it's one of the things that uh, ties the country together. Something that is really seen as benefiting not just the people who you know are getting access to communication services that they otherwise might not have access to, but it really helps the, the nation as a whole. I mean, just like it's good that you can send uh, mail to rural Alaska with a stamp and you can communicate with them. That's like a benefit to people even who live in cities. It's seen as sort of like a benefit for everyone. This was passed in 1996. And as you say, it's been ongoing. Why are there challenges to it now? 
Well, there is uh, an activist group called Consumers Research that has been filing lawsuit after lawsuit attempting to challenge this. And they've lost in every court really up until now. And they've been lost in the Fifth Circuit until now. They've lost in the, the D.C. Circuit, I believe the Sixth Circuit, the Eleventh Circuit. So they sort of had like a spray and pray philosophy of litigation. And this time it won out. And as to why now, I would expect because they see that with the shift in the makeup of the judiciary, and increasingly, you know, a lot of uh, Trump appointed judges, increasingly conservative judges who are willing to just all of a sudden find programs and policies that have been in place and supported on a bipartisan basis, as well as by both industry and consumer groups like my own. They felt like they'd have a chance of success. And at least this Fifth Circuit ruling shows that they were right. They did succeed. However, I do expect it's going to go to the Supreme Court because so many other appellate courts have ruled otherwise. Tell us about the arguments pro and con that the Fifth Circuit considered in the case. The way that universal service works is, uh, you know, admittedly, like it's a little complicated to understand that first. But basically, Congress has told the FCC to ensure universal service. So that's one part of their argument is that you can't do that. Like Congress has to spell out all of the details ahead of time in statute. They can't just give the FCC a charge such as, you know, ensure universal communication service to all Americans. So the first argument that they're making is a, a delegation challenge. And the law of the land, which has been in place for a long time, is that you know, Congress can't delegate just like actual core legislative functions. You know, Congress can't just say, we're going to create an agency and the agency is going to pass all of the laws. But Congress can delegate functions to agencies as long as they give them what is called an intelligible principle. And here the intelligible principle is, it's like, okay, FCC, you can't just do whatever you want. You just have to do things that are, in your judgment, designed to ensure universal access to communication services. And the reason you'd want an agency to do this instead of Congress is because it's a very fast-moving landscape. In our country, we've gone from telegraph to telephone to broadband. We have you know, wireline phones and wireless phones, and it's like a very shifting landscape. And you see the speed at which Congress operates and the general level of technological expertise uh, that your typical member of Congress might have. It's just not practical to have them just decide exactly how the universal service program should function. So they delegate it to the FCC, and as every court other than this recent court ruling has found, is, yes, that's an intelligible principle. That's fine. That's not an unconstitutional delegation of legislative authority to an agency. It's just a delegation to, like, fill in the blanks. Congress made the policy decision, and FCC, you go carry it out. So that's the first argument they made. And then the second argument they made is that this entity that the FCC works with to decide exactly how much telecommunications companies have to pay into the fund. It's called USAC, the Universal Service Administrative Company. And it sort of does the accounting for the FCC. Like it keeps track of revenues and it figures out how much has to be paid by who. This company, by the way, this nonprofit, it's a federally chartered nonprofit. It doesn't have any real legal power. All it can do is like accounting, what we'd call ministerial work. And then it just proposes things to the FCC. And it's up to the FCC to look at the proposals and then send out for public comment, just like it does with other any FCC rulemaking. And, it, and if it agrees, then that becomes the law. So it's still the FCC that ultimately is in charge of the regulations. Now, the plaintiffs in this case, Consumer Research and the Fifth Circuit, they, they make a lot. They say, oh, this is just like a formality because the FCC never rejects the USAC proposals. Well, there's a really good reason why the FCC doesn't reject the USAC proposals. It's that the FCC basically controls USAC to begin with. The board members of this uh, nonprofit corporation are appointed by the chair of the FCC. So you wouldn't really expect that a, a nonprofit company whose board members are appointed by the FCC who have to follow FCC rules, and all they do is basically accounting. They don't make policy choices. They don't interpret the law. They don't advocate for changes in the law. They just do accounting. So you know, why would you expect their accounting work to be somehow rejected by the FCC? But this was used as a pretext by the plaintiffs, and I would argue the Fifth Circuit, to say, 
oh, you know, the FCC, so this is the second argument that's in the case, has delegated a government function to a private entity. So in addition to the principle that Congress can't delegate its basic legislative functions to agencies, governments themselves can't outsource core government functions to private entities. However, governments always work with private companies for these sorts of ministerial type, non-policy making, no legal authority kinds of work. So what the Fifth Circuit held was, even though the universal service has been found to be not an unconstitutional delegation of legislative authority in the past, they basically said, when you take these two things together, combined, they become unconstitutional. And as the dissents in the case point out, this is completely breaking new ground. It is ignoring Supreme Court precedent. It's ignoring what other circuits have said. And it really gives the federal government and agencies effectively zero guidance as to, you know, what they can do going forward. What do they expect? So in this case, Congress passed the act and told the FTC right. to enforce the act. What do they expect? Do they expect Congress to specifically in legislation say exactly what has to be done, which will never happen? It's not entirely clear because they, they've concocted this two-part theory where it's like delegation to the FCC and then delegation from the FCC to a private company or a private nonprofit, rather. So maybe you would say under the Fifth Circuit's view, if the FCC just sort of internally did all of the work that USAC currently does, then that would be fine. Or maybe they just think that that the delegation of what the, what the Fifth Circuit has uh, incorrectly, by the way, called a, a taxing authority to the FCC, like that is still unconstitutional. I think the problem is with the Fifth Circuit in particular, and this is not just my opinion, you see it in how many times the Fifth Circuit has been reversed by a very conservative Supreme Court. So, I mean, when the Fifth Circuit is constantly being reversed by what is known as the most conservative Supreme Court in recent history, you know, they're kind of like going out on a limb. And I think that they would just move the goalposts. No matter what uh, is done, I would suppose that they might try to find a way to find it unconstitutional. But just sort of taking the document at its word, then, yeah, maybe you could fix one or two of the problems and have it uh, proceed. In the short term, what they did was they just sort of remanded the issue back to the FCC. So the FCC is going to have to consider uh, how to proceed, both in terms of how can they possibly comply with the so-called guidance of the Fifth Circuit. But what's really going to happen is the FCC is certainly going to appeal this to the Supreme Court. And like I said, the fact that other circuit courts have very recently ruled the exact opposite means that very likely the Supreme Court is going to resolve this and I would imagine that universal service, will, there might be like some sort of ruling that puts the Fifth Circuit uh, ruling on hold temporarily while the appeal continues. Yeah, the FCC has said that it intends to pursue all available avenues for review. So that leads them directly to the Supreme Court. And this was an opinion by the full Fifth Circuit. Did the original ruling by a three-judge panel uphold the legality of the USF or not? Yeah, so uh, a three-judge panel of the Fifth Circuit ruled uh, in line uh, with the other courts and, and said that the program is perfectly constitutional. And then the, uh, the court as a whole overruled that three-judge panel. Coming up next on the Bloomberg Law Show, I'll continue this conversation with John Bergmeier, legal director at Public Knowledge. We'll talk more about the Fifth Circuit and its seeming attempt to dismantle the administrative state all by itself. You're listening to Bloomberg. The Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals has limited federal agency power again, this time by limiting Congress's ability to delegate decision-making to regulators. The appellate court found that the FCC's Universal Service Fund is an unconstitutional delegation of Congress's taxing authority. The ruling is novel and is contrary to the decisions of other circuits, establishing a circuit split with the 6th and 11th circuits, which could catch the attention of the Supreme Court. 
I've been talking to John Bergmeier, legal director at Public Knowledge. Judge Ullman, who wrote the majority opinions, described the fee, which is collected from the telecommunication companies but is often passed on to consumers' phone bills, according to the court, as a multi-billion dollar tax nobody voted for. What's your response to that? Well, Congress decided that uh, the Universal Service Program should exist and gave the FCC guidance. And the last I checked, Congress is voted in by the American people. So I don't really know uh, where that is coming from. And furthermore, it's just not accurate to call it a tax. Most courts before, including the Fifth Circuit, have categorized it as a fee. That seems like a nuanced distinction. But, you know, a tax is sort of like levied on the public. Everyone has to pay no matter what. While a fee is something, you know, maybe you pay to enter a national park. That's a fee. And the universal service assessment against telecommunications companies has long been seen as a fee because it's not something that, like, all companies have to pay into. Rather, it's like a cost of doing business if you want to be part of the telecommunications network. And you get benefits from it, too, because the the communications network is regulated. uh, Like, the telephone network, for example, has been regulated by the FTC. That's why you can be on a Verizon cell phone and call someone who's an AT&T customer. You know, it's not just a private proprietary network, but we have like policies and laws that talk about how these different networks uh, interconnect with each other. And it's long been seen if you want to participate in the in the communications network and get the the benefits of FCC regulation. Phone numbers, you know, phone numbers are administered by the government. And really, if you even look at the broadband space, you know, the system of IP addresses and things like that, that's fundamentally you know, that comes from uh, federal policy. So it's been long seen as a, as a fee. It's like if you want to be a telecommunications network, you pay into this. It's a cost of doing business, but not necessarily uh, a tax. And the Fifth Circuit has precedent, which says exactly that, as does the Supreme Court. You know, and whether or not you agree with that, the Fifth Circuit is supposed to follow what the Supreme Court says, not uh, just sort of chart its own path. But they decided in this case that they get to call it a tax. In part, this is because the FCC long ago allowed communications companies to sort of present it as though it were a kind of sales tax on consumers' bills, which I think has always been a little bit misleading because it's not the same as a sales tax that's assessed on on users. It's more like a, a regulatory cost of doing business, just like if you're a restaurant, you have to you know, pay to comply with health department codes. And those costs don't get passed along to the consumer. So, you know, I think in part, uh, the sort of semi-misleading way that universal service fees have been presented to consumers, uh, you know, gives some rhetorical weight to this notion that it's somehow a tax on the American people. But when you dig into the details, you see that's not even true. So, as you mentioned, the Fifth Circuit is not only conservative, but it's an outlier. It pushes novel theories. Has it been particularly aggressive in the area of administrative law and sort of the so-called dismantling of the administrative state? I think it absolutely has been. I'd have to say the Supreme Court itself has been pretty aggressive on that front, but particularly in the area of telecommunications and Internet policy and areas like that, Uh, the Fifth Circuit has been a true outlier. So, for example, there was a case, the Murphy case, that went up to the Supreme Court about whether or not the Biden administration was able to sort of communicate with uh, social media companies at all. And the Fifth Circuit, you know, basically had a broad ruling forbidding any contact between the administration and tech companies about content moderation issues. And that was reversed by the Supreme Court. And really unusually, there's a footnote in the opinion that basically just takes note of the fact that some of the so-called facts of the case that the that the Fifth Circuit accepted just like are not remotely true. So it's not just that they got the law wrong; they deliberately distorted or accepted obvious, blatant uh, distortions of the factual record. And also, the Fifth Circuit upheld Texas's uh, social media censorship law, which would have taken away the content moderation rights of uh, private companies. Well, the Supreme Court recently said, no, Facebook and Twitter, when it comes to moderating content and deciding what people see and what users are allowed to use these private platforms, have the same First Amendment rights as other private companies like newspapers. So I think those are two recent areas where I know they've been reversed, but there's been 
you know, a ton in areas that I don't necessarily work on with, you know, access to medications and just trying to overrule the FCC or uh, constrain the administration in terms of uh, immigration policy. So it's been, I would just have to characterize it as a conservative activist court that is attempting to impose their political views on the American people by just ignoring decades of uh, Supreme Court precedent. It is out there and it has been reversed more times than it's been upheld by the Supreme Court, but it has been upheld in certain cases by the Supreme Court. Yeah. Um, So are you confident that if this case went to the Supreme Court that they would reverse the Fifth Circuit or are you unsure? I think this one, you, you can never be sure about anything, you know, especially today with the state of the judiciary. But I think there's a very good chance that they will be reversed on this in part, when you just look up uh, the makeup of the people who disagree with what the Fifth Circuit has done. So in some of the administrative law cases, like the overturning of the Chevron doctrine, you basically had industry. Industry had long wanted to get rid of Chevron. A lot of people in the conservative legal movement, the federal society types, have long wanted to get rid of Chevron. So the Fifth Circuit, you know, in terms of, you know, hostility to doctrines like that, was maybe not as far ahead of the Supreme Court as they are here. But here, this is a program that has been supported by industry, by the broadband industry, AT&T, you know, the major cable companies, Comcast. They all think that some ver- you know, everyone has ideas of how the program should be fixed, of course, and there's lots of disagreements about uh, the exact details of how the program works. But the basic idea that there should be a universal service program, that we should try to connect all Americans to the communications network, that is, uh, that is a policy that is supported by consumer advocates, industry. Uh, left and right. And the only outliers are these radical anti-tax, anti-government activists who unfortunately have found a willing ear in some of the more extreme members of the Fifth Circuit who unfortunately seem to make up a majority of it these days. Will you tell me a little bit about your organization? Sure. Uh, Public Knowledge is a a Washington, D.C.-based consumer rights organization Uh, We deal a lot with uh, communications policy, copyright, internet, telecommunications, platform regulation, things like that. Um, And we have been uh, active in these cases. So we have filed amicus briefs uh, in in, uh, various iterations of this case that have been brought repeatedly uh, by this uh, by this organization. Really trying to explain like the history and purpose of. of universal service. And one of the things that we fight for is ensuring that all Americans have access to affordable and reliable uh, communication services, uh, no matter who they are and no matter where they live. Thanks so much for coming on the show. That's John Bergmeier, Legal Director at Public Knowledge. And that's it for this edition of the Bloomberg Law Podcast. Remember, you can always get the latest legal news by subscribing and listening to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and at Bloomberg.com slash podcast slash law. I'm June Grosso, and this is Bloomberg.